Today we're going to begin the book of Ezra. And after we go through Ezra, we'll go into Nehemiah. And probably after that, uh, unless I change my mind, and I, I, don't, I don't know that I will by then, but we may. We'll look at the book of Ezekiel. And uh, that's kind of the layout for the next, next while, ever how long it takes. But we're going to begin with Ezra. And Ezra and Nehemiah are very interesting books. In, in, in a number of ways, a number of reasons. And we'll, we'll look at those as we go through both of those books. But originally, Ezra and Nehemiah were, according to Jewish teaching, the last two books of the Old Testament. If you get a Hebrew Bible, you'll see that Ezra and Nehemiah are generally the last two books of the Bible. And for a long time, they were considered a part of Chronicles. So Chronicles was at the end but it also contained Ezra and Nehemiah. And it wasn't until probably the earliest record of the books being separated uh, because Ezra and Nehemiah were considered one book because they were so similar in what they, were, what they addressed. Uh, but the earliest is around the third century AD. I think it was a region uh, was the first who divided Ezra from Nehemiah and called them two separate books. Uh, it began to be more common practice in the 9th century AD. And by the 14th century, we have what we have today is Ezra and Nehemiah as two separate books. Uh, just interesting that, to see that unfolding in history. And Ezra, the author of, of this book, is assumed to be the compiler of the Old Testament books and up until the time of his life. And probably parts of Nehemiah and possibly the book of Malachi were either written by and recorded by either Nehemiah or the Levitical priest or Malachi himself wrote it. You know, it just depends. We're not real clear on those things. And Ezra is considered or assumed to be the one who compiled all the Old Testament books into their, you know, as, as part of the Old Testament because he, he was a priest, he was a scholar, he was a teacher, a scribe, and he was the appointed envoy of the king uh, of Persia. So these qualities have been assumed to make him the most likely to be the one who compiled the Old Testament books together. And depending upon which commentator you read, Ezra and Nehemiah were written around 420 to 400 B.C. Malachi being the last book of the Bible, and depending on which commentary you read, 400, 380, 420, you know, in that time frame is when they expect or suspect that that last book was written. And it's interesting to think about, there was not another prophetic utterance after Malachi for 400 years. Not another word. The next word that came, came with the preaching of John the Baptist. And it's just interesting that, you know, no prophecies, nothing that was inspired that was recorded was given in that period of time. But in thinking about and talking about Ezra maybe being the compiler of the Old Testament, we're not, we don't know for sure. The question that rises is, Is there so much debate, discussion over who compiled the Old Testament, who wrote certain books? A lot of debate. Why, why do we not know this? And this is part of the questions that arise about the Bible. Why are there no original copies of Scripture? There are no original copies of the books of the Bible. We have very early copies, but there are no original copies. Why do we know so little about the writers? Things like this, questions that have arisen. Why do you think that's so? I mean, 
Why do we know so little? I mean, is it because the Bible is just kind of really thrown together or, or what? What do you think? Haven't given a lot of thought, huh? about the message. Not the messenger. And why is that? I, I understand that. It's about the message. The inspired message. It's not about the messenger. And, and I think uh, one of the reasons for that is the fact that we, being the carnal human beings we are, we would focus more on the messenger, where he was from, what was his background, what was his family like? What kind of dirt could we dig up on him to just, you know, this is how we think. Because if you look at all today, one of the big things now of people getting canceled is because of what somebody did 200 years ago. And we would do the same thing now. So the Lord knew that I want you to believe now, there's good reasons to believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Along with the fact that it says that it is, there is no other book that was written over a span of 1,500 years between 40 and 44 writers that agrees with itself entirely like Scripture. There is no other book that does that. But the Lord knew and the Lord wants us to believe the harmony of the scriptures, the validation, the fulfillment of all the prophecies, these things call for us to believe rather than, oh, well, yeah, I knew Isaiah. He came over to my house, bought ice cubes. I mean, you know, I knew Adam's house cat, that, that type of thing. No, we, that's not the important thing. It is the message of scripture. So it's just interesting. Why don't we know? Because it's about this. It's not about that. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. The other side of the coin of trying to dig up dirt is that, oh, these were such wonderful people. And we see it in, in, in the Catholic Church and in some of the other religions of the world. They worship the ancestors, they worship the people. And that, by worshiping the people, that's what makes their message great. No, the Bible is about the message. The people, quite often, weren't all that great. The message is. And, you know, we would either spend more time devoted to the person that wrote it or to trying to dig up something. Yeah. Right. Right, yeah, yeah. There were no, there were, and along that same line, there were no Old Testament or New Testament writers that were well received. All of them died a martyr's death of the New Testament writers. I mean, maybe John, who wrote the Gospel of John, the book of Revelation, he may have died uh, a natural death. 
but he suffered. He was, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he was in exile. Nobody liked us. <laughs> us either then or us now. And it's just interesting, you know, why don't we know? Because the Lord wants us to really consider the message, not focus on the messenger or the circumstances or whatever around it. Very, it's just very interesting. Now, in the writing of Ezra, and this is interesting about this book, there were some parts that were written before Ezra came to Jerusalem. Chapters 1 through 6 of the book of Ezra happened before Ezra ever came to Jerusalem. He didn't come to Jerusalem until chapter 7. Some 80 years after chapter 1, some 58 years after the completion of the temple. So we're not sure who wrote the first six, six chapters. Quite possibly, Ezra got the information from those that were there, or there were some other recorded documents, but the Lord certainly inspired him to include what was true and needed to be included in those first chapters. You know, once again, why do we not know? Because it's about the message. It's about what comes out of that that's, that's needed for us to learn. The Holy Spirit did validate that these records were to be included. And, you know, it's just interesting as you look at these two books, some of this background. Now, speaking of the background, how many of you enjoy reading the book of Ezra and Nehemiah? Okay, I got one hand. Huh? Huh? Yeah, okay. How many of you get tired of looking at all those names and the genealogies? Yeah. Trying to keep it straight, trying to pronounce them for crying out loud, you know, you know. Uh, and for that reason, Chronicles is the same way. I mean, there's chapter after chapter of so-and-so descended from so-and-so, and you can't pronounce the one or the other name. You know, you just kind of go through it. If you're reading your Bible through in a year, you try to read those chapters as fast as you can, just so you can get through them. And these books are often overlooked because of genealogies and of unpronounceable names and because it is, it's history. And unless you like history, you know, you say, it's blah, mm -hmm, yeah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles, yeah. But in reality, these two books are central in understanding the prophecies for the Jewish people, understanding their link with the pre-exilic Israel. The foundations of what became the twisted, arrogant scribes of Jesus' time had its foundations in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the provision for the coming of Jesus to earth is found in these two books. Prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, the ministries of Haggai, Zechariah are included in these books. Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 9 occurred during the time of these books. The book of Esther happened in the time of these books. And the last word of God to the Jews, Malachi, was most likely written during or just after the time of Nehemiah. Also, these two books give to us the history of the conclusion of the Babylonian captivity and the beginning of the 70 weeks of years that will culminate in the, in the final great tribulation. So, in other words, both Ezra and Nehemiah show us prophecy fulfilled and uniquely the elements that were used in fulfilling God's word. So these, these books are interesting, you know, for those very reasons. Now, as, as we look at the book, uh, the outline of the book is going to be very simple. In Ezra, chapters 1 through 6, is the first returning of the exiles and the temple. 
And then chapter 7 through 10, Ezra's spiritual leadership. Those are the two broad categories that make up the book of Ezra. It's interesting that Ezra's ministry is largely addressed in this book over one big issue. And we'll see that as we get in chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10. The book of Nehemiah follows kind of the same way. Chapters 1 through 7 is the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Then chapters 8 through 13 talk about Ezra's reading of the law and the revival that happened and establishing consistency. And you'll see when we get into the book of Nehemiah, consistency among those living in the land. So these are the broad categories of what we're going to be looking at as we go through these, these two books. Now there's a number of you know, purposes and themes that come out in these books. And we'll touch on those as we go along, but you'll see the continuity of God's plan and his people. You'll see the importance of separation. And this is not just for that day. These are lessons that are good for us today. We'll see elements of leadership that come out in both of these books that are very important for all of us today. We'll see the place and the importance of Scripture. We'll talk about worship, the quality of prayer, God's view of history, and the reality of persecution. These are all themes that come up in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So there's going to be a lot of interesting points that we will talk about. It will not be a, a, a long study. I don't anticipate it being a long study, but there's some very good discussion points that will come up as we go through these, these two books. So let's get started. Let's get into chapter 1 of Ezra. New International Version. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Anyone of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, When we look at these first two chapters of Ezra, and they really, you know, kind of really go together, they give to us the first returning of the exiles to Judah from the Babylonian captivity. Now, some people have called this a second exodus, but this wasn't an exodus like the first one. For a couple of reasons, primarily, they weren't returning to build a nation. They were returning to their nation, to Judah. They weren't founding a country. It had already been founded. And not everybody returned. As the proclamation of Cyrus says, you know, anybody who's willing to go, let them go. Verse 5 will tell us that those returned whom the Lord moved. In the first exodus, they all left. But in this return, it was those whose heart God moved to return. The whole nation of Israel did not return. Those in captive did not return. They were scattered. Many of them had settled and to become prosperous. And they weren't all that thrilled about going back to Israel, to Judah. So they stayed. But it was only those that God had moved their heart. And but without this return, there would be no nation of Israel today nor the preparation for Jesus' birth and the spread of the gospel. Now, the first four verses that I read to you gives to us the account of Cyrus, king of Persia, his proclamation for the return of the Jews taken into Babylonian captivity. 
And this happened in the first official year of his reign. Babylon fell and was taken probably around 539 B.C. This proclamation came out about 538. Generally, when uh, empire fell, the new king, that first year was just the establishment of his reign. The next year, next full year, was the year of ascension, the first regal year. So that's why we say that this proclamation came in about 538 B.C. And what's interesting about this proclamation is that it is presented as a fulfillment of the word of God. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, also spoken by Isaiah, you know, Isaiah chapter uh, 44, verses 28 through chapter 45, verse 4, and then Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12, and chapter 29, verse 10. In order to fulfill that prophecy made by the Lord, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, archaeology has found what is called the Cyrus Cylinder. And it was a cylinder of proclamations made by Cyrus and it shows that he made similar proclamations to other nations and to other gods when he became king. He wanted to pacify the people in all his lands. So he made a proclamation for all their gods. Notice in the, in the passage of scripture, the God that is in Jerusalem, the God who is in Jerusalem, verse three. So he considered Israel's God, just one of many. But he wanted to make everybody as happy, as keep everybody happy so all your gods are equal and all this. You know, of course, my God is the greatest because I conquered everybody. So it's interesting when you read that. There are several things that stand out about it. Scripture presents world events from the standpoint of God's outworking of his plan. In order for the word of God to be fulfilled, God moved upon the heart of Cyrus to make this proclamation. Now, he made a bunch of these proclamations. But to fulfill the word of the Lord, when God moved on this man's heart, he was a sinner. He was not a believer. But God used a sinful man's motives purposes, ideas to accomplish his will. And scripture often presents world events from the standpoint of God's outworking of his plan. This is the only, he didn't say that the Lord had told him to do this for all, of, but it was important because this fulfilled the word of God to Israel. Also, in understanding scripture's point of view in presenting world situations, people and, and people accomplishing his will were given a picture or a glimpse into the providential working of God. This was providence unfolding here. Now we talk a lot about providence in our, in our class. We've done it you know, for the, through the years. And the word providence comes from the original, from the Greek, Pronoia, and it means essentially foresight or making provision beforehand is what that word providence means. And it is interesting that God used a sinful man's position as king of a heathen nation who wanted to ensure his political stability and to reduce the chance of rebellions, God used those carnal motives to fulfill his word for his people. He moved the heart of Cyrus. God can and does use the carnal desires and actions of wicked and sinful mankind to accomplish his will. It was this interplay of politics that led to the formulation of the nation of Israel. 
You remember, you, you've heard of the Balfour Declaration. This was made by the English Foreign Office, November the 2nd, 1917. It was written to Lord Rothschild. They were in the First World War. And the English and the Allies wanted to make sure that they had as many allies as possible. And of course, the Ottoman Empire was on the side of Germany. Lawrence of Arabia, you remember all that brought down? And in order to try to ensure Jewish support for the English side of the war, they issued this statement. This is from Arthur James Balfour. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Yours sincerely, Arthur James Balfour. That one sentence was used by the Zionist movement in establishing the nation of Israel. Politically, socially, after World War II, when the Holocaust was revealed, all of these things, but this was a fulfillment of prophecy. 2,300 years before, the Lord told Ezekiel, chapter 36, he was going to gather the people back as part of the end time events. Now, Arthur James Balfour had no intention of trying to fulfill prophecy here. The English government had no intention of trying to fulfill prophecy. They were looking for allies. This one sentence has had had much debate. It's not even really clear what he's talking about here. And it's led to decades of warfare and bloodshed. But this one sentence was the political background of the formulation of Israel. But this one sentence, with all of the carnal intentions that were involved, fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah, I mean of Ezekiel. Yeah. I think because we know that God used sinful people to bring about his purpose. And that's why we're going to talk about today. He could put people in power and authority to change the direction of how we're going. And the Lord is working through the mess of the politics and social upheaval that is happening not just in our country but around the world. He's using all of that to fulfill his prophecies of the book of Revelation. Now, we tend to look at things, you know, and we've talked about this a lot before. We always look at Situations, circumstances, issues, things that affect me and you on that, you know, this little local basis. What did I do to bring this about? What kind of mess am I in? How is that going to affect me? God looks at it, you know, from his plan before the foundation of the world to the accomplishment of his will. And Scripture presents the providence of God to let us know that when we're in these little old things, God has been and is working to accomplish His will. Our opportunity to follow Him.
We've talked about it in class. You're probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but if it hadn't been for the infection that I had here with the drive line, I never would have had a heart transplant. I probably, some, David would probably be leading the class now because I'd be dead by now. Uh, if it hadn't been for that, because they already said they weren't gonna give me another heart. When they did this surgery, the surgeon said, nope, he's too old, I ain't gonna give it to him. But out of this, I had an advocate and they agreed to the surgery. But if I hadn't had this, and had lived another six months, probably would have been too old to have had the surgery. They would not have, would not have agreed to it. Providence. Now this was anything but pleasant. This whole shebang was anything but pleasant. But God used that to give me the opportunity to learn of him in ways that I could never have done otherwise. I thought I knew, but he opened the door for me to understand some things about his grace and his goodness and, and how he can be with you and the opportunities to witness and help others that I could not have had otherwise. And the things that have happened in your life, the things that are happening now in your life, they look pretty bad because it's a mess. But never forget that God is bringing things together. You don't even know what they are, but he's bringing them together for our opportunity to follow him. That's where faith comes in. We trust him. We believe in him because we know he knows the path that I take. He laid it out. And he'll be with us with that. This is our comfort, that before it happens, God's foresight, he has made provision to let us know he will not leave us. Well, I'm gonna be sick and die. Yeah, but he's not gonna leave you because you're gonna go to heaven. Tragedy has happened. Terrible things have happened. But it's an opportunity to learn of Him. That's the answer, that's the answer. Yeah. That's the I'm sure they're asking. You know, that's where, the where? That child that yeah. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be great if all that in your head, but... <sighs> Right, yeah, that there, that there is evil that happens in this world. And the only way you're going to solve that is not by gun control, it's not by societal issues, it's not by economic prosperity, it is by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that will stop someone from murdering somebody else like ha has happened this week. The grace of God is the only thing can, that can ensure that happening. That murder doesn't take place like that. One of the guys killed on that on the school bus was asleep. Never knew. Slid out of the seat dead. Because he was asleep when he was shot. But it also tells us not only that there's a lot of evil in this world, but that we need to be ready. We need to have the grace of God in our heart and life. Providence is a wonderful thing. It's hard to understand it sometimes. It's hard to see it. But if we believe all things work together for good, if we really believe that, that's right. We need to sing a song with that. I mean, bring it out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now, now we know why you got that black eye. You know, uh. But if we really believe that God works all things for our good. Even the phone going off can be, you know, give us a little laugh, help break some of the tension that's in here. You know, all of that works together. And that's one of the great things about the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, to see the providence of God at work. What looks 
today like anything but a blessing, maybe an, maybe an essential element in where you are now in your life, both physically and spiritually, and where you will be tomorrow. Now, we also see in this proclamation that this was the first of three that formed the foundation for the beginning of the 70 weeks of years. And we're all familiar with that, right? First of three. The first is this proclamation right here, which details the end of the Babylonian captivity. Remember Daniel chapter 9? He started praying because he learned from the prophecy of Jeremiah that this 70 years ought to be about done. Lord, we'll, we'll, you know, you're going to do something about this. This proclamation is the foundation for that beginning fulfillment of that 70 years. And the second that comes out and happens in this book of Ezra is the order of Artaxerxes sending Ezra to the temple to rebuild the law, to establish the law in 458. And the third is the order from Artaxerxes for Nehemiah to rebuild the walls. That happened in 445. And out of those three statements, we have the beginning of what was called told to Daniel of the 70 years, the last 70 weeks of years to complete, you know, God's plan for his people. So, questions on that? <clears throat> Different commentators use, they'll, some commentators will tell you 458 is the beginning of that first seven sevens or 49 years. Other commentators will say that the, the order of Nehemiah to go build the wall is the actual, because that's the wording in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and they look at the different dates on that. Because the first four, 49 years, establishment of the city. At the end of that time, 62 from there, they're coming in to eat whether we're ready or not. Uh, you know, when you're hungry, you're hungry. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I guess that's better than the bell ringing, isn't it? You know? But we'll, maybe I should stop right now and let it work for next week. Uh, but think about that and see if there's any questions that you might have. And we'll pick up with uh, verse 5 of chapter 1 and look at moving on from there. Thank you.